Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here in this beautiful city. First time for me, and I'm very happy to be there. And uh, I think also that the, 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 the principle of your um, meeting is very interesting, and I think it's valuable to have a meeting on atypical dementia. And uh, you have to think about increasing this uh, <laughs> this concept because it's a, it's I think it's a way. To, to speak about different uh, strategies and different um, mode of actions and so on, and also to, to share clinical exp expertise in different uh, dementia, because it's exactly what we feel in our clinical um, setting. We are facing different dementias, and I think it's, there is a real uh, concept behind that. So, as I told you, we move now to a more clinical uh, aspects of the, of the meeting now. Sorry for that. So the, the, the question was, uh, I don't know how it works. You have to tell me. Uh, I have to press something. <coughs> this this is Mac. This is Mac. And this arrow. OK, thank you. So the question, hmm? I'm not sure. Oh, yes. Sorry. So, so the, the, the title of my talk is uh, concerned the atypical cases of Alzheimer's disease. And the question is, uh, how, what does it mean, atypical cases of Alzheimer's disease? And as you will see, the, the concept of atypical AD emerges from the, 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 the change in the conceptual framework of Alzheimer's disease. Until recently, the... Uh, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease was based on a two-step process. Alzheimer was considered as a dementia, and the, the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease rely on a two-step process. First, the identification of a dementia syndrome, and then by different, uh, using different exa um, exams and uh, MRI, CSF, investigations, and so on, uh, biology, and so on, we, we were excluding the different other etiologies, and at the end of the day, we, we, we were able to, to say this is a dementia of the Alzheimer type. So it was an exclusionary process. But today, they, we, we found that there are, there are several arguments, there, there, there are several elements, evidence, that are in favor of the diagnosis of, of, of Alzheimer. And this is mainly a specific clinical phenotype that has been described, which is the amnestic syndrome of the hippocampus couple type on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's the presence of specific biomarkers based on uh, um, pathophysiological changes that we can get in, in, in the periphery of the, of the patient, I mean in the CSF or in, in, in with beta amyloid. And then, based on this evidence of the possibility to have these two arguments in favor of the diagnosis, we can now make the diagnosis um, in any condition and in, in any stage of the disease thanks to the presence of pathophysiological biomarker. And this possibility opened the, poss the, 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 the possibility to, to address the issue of specific clinical phenotype, we will discuss this later on, that can be related to Alzheimer on the presence of this in vivo pathological biomarkers that are either in the CSF or in the, um, uh, with amyloid PET. So let's, let's move now to this uh, specific clinical phenotype. The first is uh, the, uh, oops, sorry, the uh, logopenic variant of Alzheimer's disease. Apparently, based on, uh, on, on different studies, we consider that most, I would say, more than 60% of these logopenic presentation of, of primary progressive aphasia respond to a, a, a biology of Alzheimer's disease associated with a positive biomarker. And uh, you probably know that uh, Marilu Gorno Tempini, who is an Italian woman working now with the Bruce Muller group in San Francisco, has described three different um, let's say, subgroups or variant of 
primary progressive aphasia. Uh, the first is the non-fluent or agrammatic um, primary progressive aphasia, which is characterized by a slow speech rate, phonemic paraphasias, and agrammatism with a decreased comprehension of complex sentences. The second is the logopenic um, PPA here, with a fluent speech interrupted by pauses. There is a typical tip of the tongue phenomenon with a decreased single word retrieval and difficulty in repetition with a, a, a a length effect. And the third is a fluent or se semantic uh, primary progressive aphasia. It was before named a semantic dementia. With a fluent speech, uh, decreased word, a single word retrieval, semantic paraphasias, and decreased uh, single word comprehension. Interestingly, the, the neurodegenerative process th seems to, to know anatomy and also the neural, neural linguistic ar ar architectures. That's interesting to see that uh, this uh, architecture has been described by Livelt in uh, 2004. And it is based on, uh, on uh, meta-analysis. They found different code. Uh, the, uh, the first is the, 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 the phonological or lexical code, which is located in the temporal parietal junction. The second is a semantic code, which is located more anterior in, in the temporal lobe. And the third is a phonological uh, code, or the, uh, there is also the syntactic code here, which is located in the, let's say, the, the Broca's area. And interestingly, um, Sure it works. Okay. Interestingly, Corno Tampini have, have shown, based on the uh, voxel based morphometry of 31 patients with primary progressive aphasia, showed that there is a good correlation between this, this uh, neuro linguistic architecture and what they found with both voxel based morphometry. For example, in the group of non, non fluent uh, uh, progressive aphasia. They, they, sh they showed that there was a, a, an atrophy here in the broker's area, and for the semantic dementia, it was in the temporal pole, and for the uh, logopenic variant, it was more posterior in the temporal lobe and in the pyet, uh, in pyet, uh, inferior parietal lobule. The last point that I want to, to, to focus on this um, primary progressive aphasia is that by far the logopenic, the logopenic uh, variant was associated by far with the uh, um, uh, Alzheimer pathology as shown by uh, these studies with in vivo biomarker. Sorry, vivo biomarker here you see that more than uh, more than sixty percent of those patients with logopenic primary progressive aphasia have um, a, a, um, uh, evidence of uh, Alzheimer, uh, Alzheimer change in the CSF. And this has been confirmed by Bezalum on the post-mortem um, studies, uh, post studies, showing that in the logopenic uh, variant there was more than around 60% of the pa patients that have an Alzheimer pathology uh, post-mortem. I would like now to move on the posterior variant of AD. And in this case, more than 80% more than that present with a PCA presentation do have Alzheimer pathology. Initially, there was two different uh, uh, subgroups that have been proposed for uh, uh, PCA. There was the occipitotemporal one and the B et al. And this was based on the dichotomy that have been uh, proposed by, an, uh, by an, uh, uh, Angelider during the 90s, who described you know, two different pathways, visual pathways. The first pathway was the, votro top, the, the ventral pathway. That this is the occipitotemporal pathway, which is involved in the, uh, the processing of the uh, physical properties of objects, of letters, of colors and faces, and the second pathway, which is the dorsal one, 
which is more involved in the spatial localization of, of, of these objects, and also the, the, the visual control of the movement that are needed for reaching these objects. And based on that, they, they have described two different, two different uh, uh, PCI subgroups, but indeed, today, we consider that there is uh, three broad subgroups. The first is the B parietal, as I told you, which, is, um, which consists of apraxia, visuospatial problems, agraphia, Ballet syndrome, with a preserved basic perceptual abilities, object recognition and reading. The second is the occipitotemporal syndrome, with alexia, a perceptive agnosia, and or prosopagnosia, depending on the site. And in addition, there is a very rare visual variant which concerns the primary visual failure and impaired of basic, uh, with an impairment of basic perceptual abilities. I would like now to show you some, some uh, slides on the correlates between PCA and uh, uh, neuroimaging. For example, structural MRI. In some cases, we may found, as in these cases, a biparietal atrophy, as you can see here, with the right side predominance. In other cases, we can find this uh, thinning here of the posterior part of the body of the corpus callosum. This is in single cases. This is not so frequent, but when we, when we move to more, uh, more, more, more general analysis using VBM, uh, voxel-based morphometry in large group of patients, what we found is a significant dec uh, decrease in concentration of the gray matter here in the occipital temporoparietal region, including also this uh, precentral and uh, middle frontal gyrus, and uh, sometimes hippocampus. And as you can see, there is a, a tendency for a right predominance when compared to the left one. But interestingly, this uh, approach with VBM cannot always explain the phenotype that we observed in our patients. And I would like just to show you a clinical cases of a, um, a patient who have a clinical phenotype of a right hemispheric alteration with no evidence of left hemispheric involvement. There was no language disorders, no dyscalculia, and so on. And interestingly, the, the, the VBM of the patient showed a, st uh, a significant uh, atrophy of in both uh, in both hemisphere, including the left one, and it was very su surprising. And the answer came from the DTI and the fiber tracking, showing that indeed there was a, uh, an important damage of, of the white matter right fasciculus when compared to the left one, which is totally normal. And this explained that in this case the phenotype was um, in favor of a right sided hemispheric uh, um, uh, involvement, and just suggest that we have to, to try in the future to work on this with DTI and to define the, the status of the, 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 the fasciculus, white matter fasciculus. And such a discrepancy between the, the, uh, the neuroimaging uh, uh, data and the phenotype can be also uh, observed when we look at the amyloid PET in, in, in these patients. Interestingly, here in the series of, of um, subjects that we have uh, examined with um, Leonardo Cruz de Souza, we were able to show that the, the uh, I-beta deposition in, in subject with Alzheimer's disease here was exactly similar and no different at all with the distribution of um, the time amyloid accumulation in patients with PCA, indicating that, and that's interesting to, 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 to think about that, indicating that amyloid deposition is, is, is a marker of disease, but is not a marker of phenotype. And this is not the case of, by definition, of, of the metabolic activity. And I would like just to show you the differences between both in this in this uh, in, in this slide, you have here the pet, uh, the, the 
a milieu de pet distribution in, in three different conditions. You have here early onset Alzheimer's disease. Here you have a, a logopenic variant of primary progressive aphasia, and here a, a postcortical atrophy. And you see that there is exactly the, sim the same pattern of distribution that's interesting. And on the contrary, if you look at the pet FDG, you have a, a significant hypometabolism in, in this uh, region, in both, uh, bo in both hemisphere. Here in the logopenic, it's a left, it's left uh, um, hypometabolism that you find. And here in the posterior cortical atrophy, this is clearly a posterior atrophy that you see in both hemispheres. Okay, let's move now to the frontal variant. And the frontal variant is, is definitely the, the, the situation when you find a disexecutive syndrome um, who is, which, is in, in, which is in relation with uh, uh, Alzheimer pathology. It's probably the less, um, the less um, numerous cases that you see compared to the, to the others. In other words, it's, it's not so frequent to have a, 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 a clear frontal lobe dysfunction in relation with a proven EBITDA pathology, less than uh, uh, 20%. Normally, it's easy to separate both uh, phototopal dementia from Alzheimer's disease and the presence of behavioral syndrome, as I told you, the disactivity syndrome, the presence of uh, MRI changes that have been discussed this morning, or the CSF uh, pattern. And, we, there is at least two, two, two interesting works showing that it is very easy to separate both disease and the presence of this ratio of CSF tau uh, over EBITDA 42 with the threshold of 1.06, for example, here. And you can see that using this threshold, the, the, the phototypal dementia patients are similar to the normal controls, but clearly different from Alzheimer patients. And we found with uh, Leonardo de Souza, exactly the same, with the ratio of phosphato and over a beta, and you can see that there is clear separation <coughs> between both uh, population with a specificity around here, more than 80, 90% and close to 100%. So normally there is no overlap, there is no overlap, but in some cases it's more difficult. You have patients with uh, Alzheimer, Alzheimer biology, which present with uh, phototopal like behavioral syndrome, and this has been reported in literature, literature from let's say two percent to twenty-two percent. It's not so rare, as you can see, and there is, moreover, in addition, very complex cases with <coughs> clear evidence of Alzheimer uh, pathology with a mutation on C9. So it's maybe complicated in some cases, and I would like to, sh to, to discuss with you, to present to you two, 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 two cases with uh, a, a, an important behavioral uh, syndrome. These two patients presented with a frontotopal dementia at the first glance. They had, as you can see for this, uh, this woman, 49-year-old 40, woman, she had an, a severe pathy, she has a disinhibition, she has an empathy, uh, a decreased empathy. She was very logopenic. Uh, she has a, a decreased fab. Matisse was low. The Wisconsin card sorting test was low. She has some changes in the uh, social uh, assessment battery. There was a decrease in the ability to recognize uh, uh, the Ekman faces. Uh, they have, she, she, had, uh, she had a problem with the faux pas test and so on. Interestingly, she has a low free recall in the free and acute selective reminding test, uh, which was not normalized, indicating that she has some evidence of an amnestic syndrome of the hippocampal type. <coughs> Here you have her uh, um, pet FG, and you can see here that there is uh, a marked uh, frontal and also, uh, let's say, um, Hemispheric, uh, left hemispheric uh, hypometabolism, but mostly in the frontal region. And surprisingly, she had biomarker evidence of uh, a, a, a Alzheimer pathology, as indicating here by the low beta, the very high toe, 
the high phosphato and the, the, the ratio which was very significant. <coughs> and there is a second one that I would like to present, which is exactly the same. This, this man has definite evidence of a front, frontal behavioral syndrome. He presented as a frontal patient, a front, a patient with frontal topal dementia, a normal um, uh, MMSE, a, a, low, a low fab, as you can see here. Interestingly, he has a, a low free recall, which is more or less normalized by queuing. And here again, there is a low EBITA, ITO, and phosphato. <coughs> so, even in this case, the, 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 the discussion of the memory score win, may not be useful because on Berger in London has shown, for example, that uh, the, these patients, now in Cambridge, I think, yes, these patients may have an amnestic uh, episodic syndrome, uh, which is not significant when compared to education and it has been also confirmed more more recently by you showing that uh, when we, you, when you analyze a phototopal dementia patient and AD patient you may find uh, memory disorders that are more or less similar so there is no no way to to disentangle using the clinical phenotype the only way to 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 compare the, to 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 make the the diagnosis is to rely on the biomarkers and i would like to conclude on that and just to remind you there is, that there are two different types of biomarkers. Generally speaking, these, these biomarkers are this, the biological signature of the lesion of Alzheimer's disease. And as you know, this lesion can be, can be defined either by their, their nature or by the location. Their nature, there is two types of, of of amyloid of, of uh, Alzheimer lesion. There is the amyloid and the tau, and we can assess these two, these two different types of lesion using either the CSF, which provide a beta and tau levels, or by neuro, neuro um, molecular neuroimaging, such as the PET amyloid, or now the tau PET. So it's possible to assess what we have called the pathophysiological biomarkers but interestingly, these changes occur in more or less specific region of the brain, and you may have local or regional changes, for example, synaptic loss or uh, <coughs> some uh, hypometabolism. So for this reason, it is possible also to have more topographical markers, such as a cortical hypometabolism or an hippocampal atrophy, and these changes were classified as topographical or downstream markers. So there is two types of biomarkers. On the one hand, you have the di diagnostic markers. They are pathophysical markers. Okay. They reflect in vivo pathology, amyloid auto changes. They are present at all stages of the disease. They can be observable even in the asymptomatic state because they are characteristic of the of, of the disease. They might not be correlated with clinical severity, and they are very useful for inclusion in protocols of clinical trials. On the other hand, you have the progression markers. These are topographical <coughs> or downstream markers. They have a poor disease specificity, or at least less, less uh, specificity for the disease. They indicate clinical severity, staging markers. They might not be present in the early stage of the disease, and it's the reason why we consider that they should not be used for the diagnosis procedure. They quantify time to disease milestone, and they are useful for indicate uh, disease progression. So, in conclusion, the discovery of biomarkers has induced a shift in the conceptual framework of AD from a dementia to a disease. I think it's very important. Now Alzheimer is a disease, not a dementia. <clears throat> it's a disease that can be diagnosed in vivo with a high diagnostic accuracy, that can be recognized before dementia, that can be recognized in atypical presentation when there is a presence of 
of course less common, but still well-characterized clinical phenotypes. These atypical form of Alzheimer's disease should not be anything. They have clearly identified, it can be logopenic aphasia, the posterior cortical atrophy, the frontal variant of AD, maybe the corticobasal syndrome, and they rely on the presence of the in vivo evidence of pathophysiological biomarkers. I thank you for your attention.